in the twinkling of an eye, the Lord's going to come back and get his church. And friend, I want to tell you, I don't know about you, but there is a, an excitement on the inside of me, but there's an urgency on the inside of me to not live for myself any longer. That what Paul said, and it's not I who live, but Christ that lives in and through me. There is people in this community, in your life, that don't know Jesus. And I pray today that we do not waste any more time with trying to struggle and do things for ourselves. That we would release all of that and say, God, you are the sustainer of my life. You're my protector. You're my provider. I want to go get your lost sons and daughters. I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen. Because the trumpet is about to sound and we're about to get out of here. I think if everybody in this room, I think all of us, if we could see how close it is, to that angel blowing that trumpet, we'd probably have a hard time sleeping at night. Knowing that not only is Jesus about to come back to get his church, but there is people in this room that you've got loved ones that you know probably wouldn't go when that trumpet sounds. That should make us want to fast and pray, and we're in the midst of fasting right now. We're in the midst of fasting and praying. And, I'm, and I will say this, if you've not jumped on the wagon of fasting and praying with us, today is the day. We're going from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the next 21 days. And we're going hard in Jesus' name because we don't want to become cold Christians. Amen? We don't want to become a lukewarm church. We want to be a church that's on fire for God. Amen? That we're not just on fire and excited on Sunday. No, we take, this is a personal relationship, y'all. A personal relationship. Hallelujah, just like me and my wife, we have a personal relationship. But if I never spent time with her, I would never, ever be able to enjoy all the benefits that are found inside of her. I'm telling you, man, Sunday is just a booster shot to get you excited about Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Amen? Get close to God. Amen? I mean, a church service can do wonders, man. We can sing songs and we can get excited, but guess what? Your messy hair is going to be showing up on, on Monday morning, okay? Your bad breath is going to be there Monday morning, amen? It's coming, amen? And what are you going to do then? Are you still going to sing the praises when you look like a train wreck, when you feel like a train wreck, when everything in your life ain't going right? Will you praise him? Will you shout the glory of God, amen? That's what we're talking about. That's what, I, what the God's looking for, amen? Hallelujah. Well, how many of y'all are glad y'all came to church today? I'm glad I came to church today. I'll tell you what, man. I'm happy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Great job, guys. Y'all did a great job. Give these guys a hand. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Belinda, you can stay up here. Where are you going? Come on. Hallelujah. Well, we're not going to do it. Y'all can be seated. Hallelujah. We have some special guests here, and we want to give them plenty of time to, uh, to do what God's called them to do. I'm really excited about Miss Lisa and the whole team here. Got some wonderful ladies here that are going to be sharing the good things of God and what he's doing. Amen. But before we do that, how many of you know at uh, Revolution Church we have an outreach ministry? Keisha, would you come up here for a minute? Come on up here, Keisha. You didn't know you was going to get this, right? Come on, Keisha. You just happened to wear this shirt. You asked for it. Come on up here, Keisha. Here you go. Come on up on stage. All right. Now turn around, Keisha. Okay, we have an outreach ministry here at Revolution Church. Amen? That we like to go out, okay, and reach those that are far from Christ. How many of you know that the excitement really gets you know, fun when you leave the church and you start taking Jesus out there to the community. Amen? Well, we've done this. We did this last Saturday in the square. We had the whole square to ourselves. Amen? And then this past Friday, we actually went to the school. You can be seated. Y'all give her a hand. I just want y'all to see the shirt. Amen? And if you don't have a shirt like that, y'all need to get with us because we're going to be ordering some more shirts. We want everybody in this church to have one of these shirts because everybody in this church is a part of outreach. Everybody. And that means you can come out, if you do nothing but hand people water, help set up, tear down. You, it's not about you coming out and feeling like you've got to preach to everybody that walks on the sidewalk. But I promise you, you get out there around them long enough, you're going to be talking to somebody about Jesus. Amen? You're going to get excited about it. Amen? I can tell you, it beats sitting at home and doing anything else you would do. Take two or three hours out of your life and come and be a part. Okay? This Friday, this, uh, the home game for the McDonough High School. Amen? It's their home game. Okay? Man, we had a blast, okay? We had a blast. Did we not have a blast? Hallelujah. And, man, I'm telling you, I got to meet the athletic director. I got to shake hands with the coach. I mean, I'm telling you, that principal, uh, Miss uh, Blazingame, amen. How, what's the first name? Monica. Monica. I'm going with Monica. Blazingame kind of gets me. I get tongue-tied on that. But, but Monica actually found out that we was doing it. She didn't know we was doing it. 
So she actually started saying, is my church out there? Is my church out there? So she came running out there just to see. Her. She's calling us her church. I said, Monica, you better know God's going to wake you up. going to bring you right on in this building. You come into this house. Hallelujah. I'm telling you. I, I, and I don't know if I, many of y'all were here when I said this, but on day one, we sent her a bouquet of flowers telling her how much we love her, how much this church loves her. Why? Because she's the doorway that God's going to use to get us into that school. And we're walking right in there. I'm telling you, I talked to the coach. He, they were blown away at what the team did this past Friday with all the food and everything. And it was just a handful of us. Amen. They were excited. The kids were excited. And then the athletic director, I'm telling you, we've got an open door, y'all. I'm telling you, we, I mean, I prayed a prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Not no, well, uh, we bow our heads. Oh, how Father, how in heaven, oh, in, in his name. No, we said the name of Jesus. Amen. Because the name of Jesus is what causes the demons and devils to tremble. Amen. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, man, we have an open door. And we, uh, Miss Lori put together a little video. And I want you guys to see that video clip. And uh, be encouraged. Don't, don't, don't look at it as a down put. But be encouraged. We want everybody to be a part of this. On. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you join us? That's the question right there. Will you join us? Okay. I'm telling you, man, you want to experience freedom, then bring something to somebody else. He said, well, man, Pastor, I don't have time. You know, I was in Alpharetta Friday and had to get off work early and drive an hour and a half to get here in time to get a shower and get there. Now, some people have jobs. They can't do that. Okay. But I'm telling you, you want to experience a life. <laughs> This a life worth living is start giving. Give yourself away. And I'm telling you, these kids, we, this is ripe. I'm telling you, we have a window right here, y'all. And I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, just looking at that coach, we're going to see revival break out. They're open to a, a meetings and getting together and doing bigger things together. I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, it was just, it was just an amazing, amazing time. So I forgot that we did the uh, April, we did the uh, Easter outreach too. That was in there. And then we also had the back to school. They were out there. Did y'all see them just kind of with their sides and stuff, waving at the kids. That's our school in Jesus' name. That's our school, amen, and we're going to take it for Jesus. So, hey, just think about it. We're going to, uh, we're going to actually be, we're going to be preparing a five-star meal this weekend. You think they were excited this past weekend. We're about to blow their doors off this weekend. I mean, you say, well, man, that just costs, that's a lot of money. Yeah, we got it. We, we all got it, right? We're wealthy people, right? We ain't broke, amen. We got money, amen, and we're sowing seed into the next generation, Amen. And I'm telling you, those kids were so thank, thank you, thank you. They were so thankful. I'm telling you guys, we're gonna we're gonna see God do some things. Y'all excited about that? Amen. Hallelujah. And what's really funny 
is they all went to Relevant Church. Have y'all heard, y'all, y'all heard of Relevant Church, right? It's a real small church in Locust Grove. You, can't, you, you run right by it, you know? I mean, they're, they're struggling. You need to pray for them, okay? Uh, well, they all went down there and actually was a part of their service. Well, Relevant's mission is Locust Grove High School, okay? That's their mission, okay? Because the lady that's over the FCA at McDonough High School, okay, she goes to Relevant. But we even had her smiling big, didn't we? She was excited. I'm serious. I mean, man, you could just see the joy just all over them, man, when we was doing this, you know. And I'm just thinking, so the coach was telling me, yeah, man, we all went to Relevant. And the kids, you know, they drove up. You know, we saw that big building. They was like, wow, we thought this was a warehouse. So here they're getting out of the car. They go into this big building. And y'all know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You go into the big building with the big church, the big stage, the big wall, the big everything. And I'm like, time out, time out, time out. I, I know you're excited, brother. But, 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 but we are growing. Okay, we're, we're headed in that direction, okay? I, I just, you know, just know this, that when you come out to our church, we, uh, we may not be as big as others, but we are actually, we will outlove others. We're going to love you, amen? We'll put our love to the test with any other church around here, not that we're in competition. We're a healthy competition. We can have a little healthy competition. But, but again, this is going to change, amen? So I was just telling the coach, hey, look, man, you know, because he's like, hey, want to get and come out. Yeah, we want to come out and do something. But, you know, and that's why this Sunday night coming up, we're actually going to meet with all those that have a passion to reach the young generation. We're going to be meeting here, amen? We're going to have a fun time, but we're going to start setting our sights on doing some things big because we believe that school's coming, along with our, you know, young people that we have here, young adults and young people so you want to say anything into that just that when we do invite them of course they're not going to feel like they did when they came into relevant right as far as the big awe as far as i'm just talking about the big building awe thing yeah they won't go man but we're going to have to actually we're going to have to all actually probably stand up because there's 89 of them (laughs) so this will be a service basically i told nathan we probably just need to have a whole nother service so we'll have our service and then we'll have a whole nother service to invite them to and just treat them like royalty. And then <laughs> they'll feel the love. They'll feel God. Because I'm telling you, that coach, man, I'm telling you, we connected. We connected in a big way. I'm telling you, get me in that locker room. Just get me in there. I'm telling you, I mean, it's going it's to be fun. We're going to have a good time. I'm excited about it. I'm fired up about it. So uh, thank you guys for your generosity. You guys make this happen. You're giving and stuff. We really do. You want to say something? I was just going to say, we're just tired of the devil trying to take control of everything okay so we're going to get our foot in the door and we're going to take control of a few things and try to turn these things around and we have lots of people doing different things in here that can actually help these kids not go down the wrong road you Mm -hmm. know so we're going to hear a great testimony in just a minute but we don't want them to even go down that road we want to stop them before they get there so We yeah. believe they're going to all know Jesus. Yeah, and again, they're all looking and searching. And again, with this church, when we go do outreach, we're not out there doing outreach trying to talk about the things that are going on. We're not going to debate, okay? We're bringing the good news of the gospel. That means we're not going to go out there, what do you think about transgender people? What do you think about? No, 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 no. See, all those are secondary, okay? We've got to get to the heart of the men and women, okay? And if you find yourself just debating on all those issues, you're going to probably walk away ticked off and mad, okay? But if we try to let them know, look, look, look let me just tell you the good news, okay? Let's don't, let's don't talk about what you can't do for God. Let's talk about what you can do for God and what you need. To, let's talk about the goodness of God. That's what this church is going to be about, amen? Not that we're not going to preach on these things and talk about, it. yeah, I'm going to do that. Y'all know me, okay? We're going to do that. But again, when we go out there to the world, they're looking at the church as the judger, the condemner. Right, you can't drink, you can't do nothing, you can't have no fun when you go to church. And we don't want to focus on that, okay? Those are all issues that God will fix once their heart is renewed, amen? Get the heart right, everything else goes right, amen? I'm not arguing with somebody about what gender should be or what pronoun you should use. That Get the gospel. There's where the power is, amen? There's no power in talking about that other stuff, amen? We all going to get mad and slap each other. We'll have a UFC round. I mean, we're kicking it around there, you know? So we're not going to do that. So know that when you are part of this outreach team, we're not going out there and, and got billboards, you know, you turn and burn, you're going to hell if you don't get right. We're going, no, we're not doing all that. Nobody wants to see that, okay? I mean, I don't know about you guys. I don't want to see that, okay? So anyway, it's going to be fun. So we're going to give real quick, and then we're going to turn this service over to these wonderful ladies here. They've got some exciting stuff. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So are you ready to give? <laughs> Let's try it again. Are y'all ready to give? Come on. Let's get excited, man.
we got an opportunity to give to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I know I'm excited to give. So uh, there's many ways you can give. Glory to God, the barn offering, which is basically check or cash, online, text, cash app, Venmo. My gosh, man, we've got all these ways to give nowadays. Heck, 30 years ago when I started going to church, you had check, you had cash. That's it. We didn't have all that other stuff. Amen. But we do appreciate everybody's faithfulness in their giving, and we do not take this lightly. Amen. Because God don't take it lightly. Amen. When you invest your money into the kingdom of God, God promises you that he will return much more to you. Why? Because he takes our seed, he multiplies it so we can do more for him. This is the way that God has set it up. Amen. And I know there's a lot of negative stuff out there about giving or you know money to the church and all that. Don't listen to those lies, okay? I mean, there's bad people at Walmart, but you still go. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I mean, there's bad lawyers. There's bad doctors. I mean, it don't mean everybody's bad, okay? There is a lot of good people. And I still am convinced that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest place that you could ever put yourself into, period. And the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is doing more good for the world than any other organization. It ain't even close. I'm just telling you, it's not even close. So when people start bad-mouthing the, the church, nah, don't pay no attention to it. You know, cut them off, okay? We are, as a church, doing some good things, amen? So, and if this is your first time here, which I know is y'all's first time here, hallelujah, but if this is your first time here, we have a welcome home card. We'd love for you to fill out and drop in the uh, offering box. We'd love for you to put it in there. We'll send you some information and get you to come back the next time. We'll knock on your door and bring you dinner. No, we're not going to do all that, amen? Are y'all happy today? Come on, man. Yeah, come on, let's get it, man. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, why don't you, uh, why don't we stand one more time before we introduce these wonderful ladies, and uh, we'll lift up our offering. Many of you guys maybe give during the week through text and through other means, so I'm going to pray over all of our offerings. So, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and me and Belinda bring our offering and our tithes to you, Father God, in Jesus' name, along with the, the family of God here today at Revolution. And, Father, many have given during this past week. Many will give this next week. Father God, we bring these to you because you are holy, you are wonderful, you're glorious. And we do want to see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know, Father, that it takes money to do these things on this earth. So we just thank you, Father God, that you receive our tithes and offerings. And that, Father God, you open that window over our life and pour out blessings that we don't have room enough to contain. To where the overflow in our life will just go and help people in the community, people on our jobs, people in our family. Just thank you, Lord, for adding to us so we can help others see the generosity of Jesus Christ. We give you praise and glory and honor in the matchless, wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so who knows that God works in strategic ways? He gets you right where you need to be when you need to be somewhere, right? <laughs> So, not too long ago, and I believe, first of all, I believe everybody is here for a reason mm -hmm. today. So, make sure you listen, turn your ears on, and listen with your heart to what's going to be said today. But strategically, God has led us to have Miss Lisa come today. So, this is how it happened. I was sitting in a chair getting my hair done, and the lady asked me, she said, so what's going on at your church? You know, so I told her that we were going to be doing some testimonies over the summer, and she said, you know who you need to have? And she mentioned a couple of people. And so this was one of them. But I have the privilege to actually get to announce that Miss Lisa Hensley is going to come and give us the word today. She had, has written a book. And I read the book. And the book is awesome. I could not put it down. It was so good. It just kind of keeps you going. It's not the one that you put your little bookmark in and save it for another day. It's you just keep going. So you're going to enjoy this message today, and we just thank you for being Amen. here. Amen. Thank you so much. You. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? I want to tell you something. I'm so thankful to be in a church this morning that gets outside the walls of the church. Amen. There's a lot of them not doing that anymore. And there's a generation out there that's dying that's been led astray, and it is up to the church and the body of Christ to get outside the walls and not through those doors and, and to show the love of Christ and, and to give the gospel and to, and to help them come to know the Lord. Um, it's, not, it's not being done a lot of places. So um, I'm very thankful for you, Pastor. I see your enthusiasm. I see your fire and your power. Uh, 
just your burning desire to do that. And I'm very thankful. So my name is Lisa. I'm very thankful to be here. I've been going to Barbara about 16 years. I thought we were going to cross ways when I quit coloring my hair. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm from Milner, Georgia, about two exits down south in that little area, uh, Milner, Jackson, Buckner's Chicken. Anybody know Buckner's Chicken? So I live in that, na in that uh, neighborhood. And uh, so when Belinda called me and asked me to come, I, I'm always excited just to tell the story of God's glory in my life. I mean, we should never not be, a, we should never be afraid to tell the story. And I got that scripture this morning as I was reading. We have overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Because I'm going to tell you, I woke up this morning, had a little family issue last night. So I stayed up all night wrestling with that in my own strength. So this morning when I got up, I had the doldrums. I mean, I was like, I don't know which church I'm going to. I don't know what, I don't know anything about it. I told, told Ash, please pray for me. Until I walked in here and those songs of worship reminded me who I am who I belong to, what he did, and I have a whole lot to be excited for. And he's going to handle anything that the enemy throws at me. Amen. Just give it to him. Put it at his feet. Okay, so um, I have a, not a clue of what we're going to do, so just buckle up. Thank you for flying with Lisa. <laughs> we may go left and we may go right. I serve um, at two ministries um, here in Milner. I serve with the Potter's House for Women. Has anybody ever heard of that ministry? And what the, we know Michael. Yes, yes, we know Michael. We used to go to Impact and, and serve and stuff. So, But anyway, the Potter's House for Women is a discipleship for women of addiction, abuse, wrong decisions, just trauma. And what we do when the ladies come in, we look for women who are completely broken and ready for help. Um, it's the neatest thing how God brings them. Um, it, you can be in another state and, and just a God-ordained divine appointment with a sheep that's just crying out. And then somebody knew somebody that knew somebody and brought them to our doorstep. And what we do, we just teach the Word of God. We teach discipleship. We teach a personal relationship with Christ because if you're like me, before I came to know Christ, I knew there was a God because my grandmother, Meemaw, had taught it. You know, you, she didn't even have to tell me about God. She lived it. But I never went to church as a child. Um, we'd get a Miss, well, I did, but never with my family. We, we'd load up in Miss Endel's station wagon, the whole neighborhood, and we'd go to the youth, and then we would, you know, go back home. So that is about as much as I knew. But um, let me stay on track here, Lord. But that's what we do. We disciple them. We lead them and, um, and just teach them um, who Christ is, the Word of God, what the Bible says. And then another ministry I serve on is Caitlin's Promise. Um, that is uh, on the back end of the Potter's House and other ministries in the community. I look for that one girl whenever she's getting ready to complete her program who has absolutely nobody because of the bridges she's burned the choices she's made. And God has cleaned her up and he's set her free. But how do you get out of that deep hole that she walked out of into her nest of safety, her, her new door of hope? Okay, it's still out there. So who helps them with the birth certificates, social security cards, license reinstatements, um, child support arrears? How do they get out of that? How do they get a job when they've got like I had when I came through there 16 years ago, 31 felonies and arrest on my record. Who helps them? And so that's where I go into play. The Lord just, you know, he showed it through your, he used your own life and your own experiences. So um, I came to the Potter's House 16 years ago, but those are the two ministries I, I serve on, and I love it. And these two girls up here, Tiffany and Ashley, um, Ashley is the house mom of the Potter's House. She's been there two years. I actually interviewed actually, um, Ashley behind plexiglass at um, Monroe County. Um, she was looking at many years behind bars. And um, God sent us there through um, one of the deputies that saw something in her. Um, she had lived a lifetime of drug and addiction. And so when I interviewed Ashley, um, 
I just, you know, you just see Jesus. You're like, Jesus, thank you for saving her life. Thank you for putting her in jail. Thank you, God. And just looking at the deputy, how do I get her out of here? How do I get her out of here? I picked her up, took her to Walmart because she didn't have anything but the clothes she wore in and in and due, the, due to the starches, <laughs> had bloomed a little bit. But um, went to Walmart and, and got her some just the basic essentials and, and now look at her two years later. She's the house mom. Amen. She's uh, got two, uh, three children, twins, and another daughter, and she went to her first high school graduation this year to a family that was just closed from her coming back in because of how many times she'd come through back, you know, back and forth. And then we have Tiffany. Um, she's in the program. How long have you been there, Tiffany? Two months. Tiffany came through before, and she chose to go back out. But you know what? Praise God, he didn't let her die. Praise God, he didn't let her die. So she came back. She's there with us. Um, and to the Lord, um, does whatever he wants to do. So anyway, we're thankful to be here. Um, I think I might have mentioned, I came through there 16 years ago. I, I just, I didn't just always look this together. I can assure you. Um, I didn't. I, I'm from Arkansas. I'm not even from Georgia. I was your just typical cowgirl rode horses. Love, um, love life, I'd wrestle with my brother, had two sisters, my mom and a stepfather. I never knew my dad. Um, everything was wonderful. I was just your biggest tomboy, climbed trees and everything. I've been in many head claws and so forth. But anyway, um, at eight years old, my life drastically changed through the hands of, you know, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but um, through something that occurred to a little girl that shouldn't have. Amen? Everybody get that? Um, and I never told. So from that moment on, um, I just shut down. See, the enemy already knew what God had planned for me. And I believe with everything that I am that he snatched my identity. And from that time on, as a man thinks in his heart, so did I in that dark. I was unclean. I was guilty. The father figure that I knew was not to be trusted, was never to be made vulnerable. And so away I went. And from that time in, the, in my life, my life changed. Um, Fifteen, started going with the wrong crowd. I want to tell some of the younger kids here. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've looked back at this age and saw where I took the bait of the enemy, through trying to fit in, through holding secrets that were killing me, through not believing my mom and dad loved me more than anything, or even the fact of going to a trusted adult, because we don't all have real functional families sometimes, going to somebody like pastor and his wife or some of the women and men I see in this church and saying, hey, I need to talk. I need to talk. That's what the security place is. I need to talk. I'm having issues, and I don't want it to go any further. I heard what Miss Lisa said. I've heard what Pastor said. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I never told. I went through at 15, you know, the weed and, 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 and just trying to fit in, the drinking, partying, just kid stuff, you know. By the end of 15, I was heading my first pregnancy. And I'm not going to just keep dabbling. Just, oh, God's telling me to move on. By the time I was 17, I was pregnant again. I only had one child, though. Because of the first one, they told me how easy it was to take care of it, but they didn't tell me what would be birth that day. Years of guilt. By 17, I had another son, and his name was Joshua. And I needed something, somebody to love me because I was filthy. I was just, I mean, the voices in my head, and overweight and bleached hair, and I just didn't know where I belonged, so I kept going toward the ones who smoked pe weed and, and, you know, the cool kids and the ones that, you know, Mom, I know what I'm doing, Mom, I know what I'm doing. I know, I, I got this, Mom. And I didn't realize that it was gonna go as deep as it did. So I had Joshua and I tried to, then here I am, a, a teenage mom with no husband, the talk of the town, 
trying to work, didn't, hadn't, didn't graduate high school, because all the other girls I knew went on, and, and trying to do the right thing, trying to be a mom. But I just, I couldn't, something was broken, so instead of talking to somebody or, or trying to, I just kept going deeper and deeper in the water of darkness. I ended up um, drinking more, using more drugs and different things, and you just think it's a party. Let me tell you something. I had no intention of becoming the person I did. Never in a million years. I had dreams of a white picket fence, a husband and kids, and my mom living next door, and me, my all, and, and everything else. And all of a sudden, I'm a complete different person from choices. Choices I'm making. Not having the courage to stand up and say, I heard what that woman said, and I'm, I, you know what? I'm going to make a good choice. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. That's the truth right there. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I'm going to tell you something. When they're a friend, they're not going to allow you to step across that boundary. And I'm going to tell you that. And they're not going to want you to do something they know is going to hurt you. Ended up marrying a man, going with a guy, and, um, and he introduced me to uh, cocaine, meth. Now, I was just smoking weed. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing all kinds of stuff. I'm just running and running. My mother was constantly telling me, quit doing that. What are you doing? He's no good for you. And, of course, I wouldn't listen to her because I just loved him. You know, he's constantly putting drugs in me. I just loved him. He loves me. And then the beating started. And so this, this kept on. I started putting with Joshua with Mom more and more and more. In and out, in and out, partying, partying. But I'm going to stop. I'm just having a good time. I'm young. I had no idea it was fixing to swallow me whole. I ended up marrying Danny. And, of course, the beatings grew worse. The drug addiction got worse. I left Joshua more and more at my mother's. And one night I got up, and it was in the middle of the night, and I got him out of his bed. And I went into the deepest of the drug area, and I was getting me some stuff. And... I remember looking back in the back seat and my baby was back there asleep and I thought he was five years old. And I'm like, what am I doing? Dear God, what am I doing? And so I drove to my mom's house and I beat on her door and I, she came to the door and I said, Mom, you gotta take him. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm sick. And she said, what are you talking about, Lisa? I said, I'm on drugs and you gotta take him. And I left that night, and I knew I was never coming back. Because, see, I was trash. I was no good. I was guilty. It was me. I left that night. I went back to Danny's. He beat me so bad. I ended up leaving, and I ran to a big city like our Atlanta in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I was just a little old country girl with a big addiction by then and a completely de defeated mindset. And as I was uh, sitting there on the corner, a girl walked up, and she started talking to me. And from that point on, for the next 26 years, I would roam the streets and selling everything that I had, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. When you're in that kind of situation, you do what it takes. And let me tell you, I got high to live, and I lived to get high because I did not want to face what I had become. And when you're out there on the streets as a homeless person, selling your body and everything else, you get beat up a lot, you get raped a lot, you get held at gunpoint a lot, you get strangled a lot, left for dead. You have a lot of things happen to you. And you just get up, and you don't understand how in the world you're even going to be able to, to get that out of your mind, but just give me another hit. And you know what? I always cry out to God. I knew there was a God in my darkness because he saved my life too many times. I knew there was, but I didn't know how to walk with him. And then I started my judicial system, going in and out, just a little bit of trouble. And then I would get in, and then if you can't stay clean, you're not going to go back to the probation. So I'd run, and they'd catch me again, and I'd go back to jail. Well, see, jail was where Jesus was for me. And they call it jailhouse religion. Well, I beg to differ. 
Because if that's what it takes to get you set down into the feet of Jesus, praise God. Praise God. I cannot stand it when someone says, oh, they got the jailhouse. Yes, they got Jesus. They just don't know how to walk with him when they get out. And when I would go in, Jesus would be in that cell. And I remember, oh, my goodness, I'd, I'd sleep. And then when I wake up, I dreaded coming down because Josh was five, and then he was six, and then he was seven. And, and then I'm going to go back. And then I'd, I'd go back, and mommy home, mommy gone, mommy home, mommy gone. And, and then just, you know, abortion after abortion, just all the stuff that happens. And, and then just laying in my cell, and I'd wake up finally after about a week of sleeping. And, and I'd think, God, oh, what have I done? What have I done? How could I be such a monster? And then it's like the Lord would start ministering to me in there. And I didn't know why or how he would. But I just always say, does anybody have a Bible? I don't know how to read it, but just could you give me a Bible? I knew that that's where the freedom was. I don't know how I knew, but I knew. The next 26 years... I did pray one time for God to bring me a rich man. Because, <laughs> you know, if it ain't drugs, one time in jail, I was like, God, if you just bring me a rich man, this will all go away. I can do if you just bring me a rich man. Well, it did. And I was miserable. It ain't material things either. It ain't going to take no Wrangler Jeep, Cadillac, Taurus, SHO, five and six cars. Brand new home, my own bedroom. That's not going to do it. I tried it. I've tried everything. <clears throat> I remember sitting in prison one time. I quit the jail system. I started crossing the states from, George, from Arkansas toward Georgia. And it was so funny because it let me out of prison. And do I look like a prison person? <laughs> well, I was in prison with my darkness, but praise God I've been set free. But... I did a most of my life in prison. You're looking at somebody that crossed four states. In and out. In and out. Prison wasn't nothing to me. But I'd get out. They'd go to let me out. And they would send me further into Georgia. I'm like, why are y'all sending me to Georgia? I'm not from Georgia. I'm from Arkansas. They'd say, well, if you want off this campus, you better get on the bus. And they'd send me into a, a, a transition place right in the middle of the drug area. I would do good for a little while. Because, see, I could get sober, but I couldn't get changed. When you have Christ, you can get changed. When you truly receive Christ, I could get sober and I could count my days, but I was miserable. I was just miserable. So I'd do good. I'd even visit a church, a small one like this, and my skin would just crawl. And I would say, I don't know why I can't be a church person. Why can't I be a church person? And then I'd end up leaving in, in hit the streets again. Last time I was in prison in Metro State, they crossed over and they said, inmate Hensley, your mama died. They tracked you down by your criminal history. She's been dead 12 days. I never cried. And I remember sitting in that prison and I remember asking God, why won't you let me die? Why won't you let me die? And I heard the Lord very clearly. He said, you're going to help women like you. And I'm like, that is such a joke. I can't even help myself. Whenever I got out of that prison, that's about the time I met Everett, my rich man. <laughs> and it got me even into Locust Grove. And, you know, one thing about it is when my life started going toward the potter's house, I did not... I, by then, I was 44 years old. I started this journey at eight. I was 44. I was tired. My family had completely disowned me. My child was grown. I had 31 arrests on my record. You know, and there, there was just no, I had a frozen shoulder from jumping off a, a second story balcony and just a whole lot of damage physically just from being the trash that I was or what I thought I was. And I remember getting sober at Everett's, and I was going to do good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm going to do good. And I started working at Publix in the deli, and I was doing good for a while. And then that's when God started showing me that everything he had was not going to set me free. 
And so I started dibbling and dabbling. Every time he'd go off on the road, I'd dibble. And I was so miserable. I hated myself. And I remember thinking, you know what? I need to just take me on up out of here. That's what I can do. I can just take me on up out of here. And when you get a relief on something like that, you're in trouble. And so this lady comes in from Eagle's Land, and her name's Julie Wilkins. She was getting her some deli meat, her and her husband, Mr. Ken, on Sunday. And I was in this mindset, and I was cutting her meat. And we're going, hey, how you doing? Good to see you, blah, blah, blah. And I cut her meat, and she went on. And then Wednesday was when I was really getting the plan together. Because on Friday when I got paid, I knew what I was going to do. And this lady comes in, a church lady. Somebody that got outside the walls of the church. And she walked in and she said, honey, can I talk to you just a minute? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she walked me around the produce counter over there to the produce from the deli counter. And she said, honey, God has not let me sleep until I've got back up here to see about you. Are you okay? And I don't know what made me did it, do it, but I said, ma'am, I've not been okay in a long time. And I remember just laying my hand on her shoulder, and I just started bawling. And she rubbed my back. I hadn't had my back rubbed since I laid across it as a young child in my mamma's lap. And it was like the Lord just used that to rub my back. And then she pulled me back, and she said, Will you let me call you every day? Will you answer? Will you watch a lady named Joyce Meyer? And I was like, yes, ma'am. At the time, I was like, yes, ma'am. Well, then it started. And I was like, there's that crazy lady calling again. Oh, she's calling me again. And she kept telling me about this place called the Potter's House. I didn't want to go to another place. I was 44 years old. I, I had done, tried it every which way. I had done every recovery center. I had done every penitentiary and from Arkansas to Georgia. I've done it all. I can do it myself. I can do it myself. I can do it myself. I fought my whole life. I can do it. And finally one day I called her and I said, I had went to a, um, a, one of their groups and I saw it and I was like, whoa, that lady's got white hair and she's got to be Moses' wife. And uh, oh my gosh, they really act like they like it here. So they've got to be on punch or something. Uh, but anyway, um, I went home and I took the newsletter they gave to me and I just, God was just working on me. And I would rub their faces. And I would just sit on the floor of the room that I was in. I couldn't get on the bed. I wasn't allowed on the bed. This lady had let me stay, but I don't get on the bed, but you can sleep on the floor. And I just remember rubbing it. And there's more to the stories. But I remember picking up that phone, and I said, Julie, come get me before I change my mind. I think she was hiding outside the trailer. Because I'm telling you, she was there. And whenever I got out of that car, I was nervous. I didn't know how God was going to do it, because how was he possibly going to be able to fix me, this old drug addict prostitute? Sold, unfit mother, trash. And I just remember before I stepped in, I said, you know what, God, if you're real, I'm going to try this one more time. But if you can't fix me in here, I will be okay dying out there. But while I'm in here, I'll do whatever that white-headed lady tells me to do. And I'll do it with my whole heart. So let's do it. And I stepped across. And from that moment on, God met me there. It was the coolest thing. The first tour I got was baseboards. <laughs> I'm like, baseboards? Really? Baseboards? And then God reminded me, what would you say you was going to do? the best of your ability, so I hit my knees. He said, is this what it takes to get you on your knees? Let's have the cleanest baseboards in this house. And honey, I did. And everything they told me to do, I did it to the best of my ability. You know what the first scripture was he gave me? Because, you know, I couldn't get past my past. I knew I was least an addict. I knew rarely have we seen a person fail their first. But I knew all that. But I couldn't get past my past. But the first scripture God gave me, you're a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. 
And I just remember thinking, I only had a garbage bag. I said, you know, God, I, I don't know that I really believe that, but that's all I got. And I just started walking, and she started telling me, started showing me this Bible, and it wasn't Adam and Eve and their kids and their kids, and then Jesus popped up. It was like the minor prophets and the major prophets, and oh, my goodness, and this goes here and that goes there. You're kidding. And I can get up in the morning and really talk to him, and oh, my goodness, I think he just talked to me. Oh, my goodness. Everything started changing. It was the relationship. It was the relationship that changed. I got in the middle of that floor where we live now 16 years ago, and I told him, I said, I give up. I, I, just, I just ask you into my heart, please forgive me. I didn't have a Shazam. I, didn't, well, I did in my heart because that's what he said happened. But I didn't jump up and say, oh, okay, I'm good. No, I still had issues. But what I did have was my salvation. Praise God. And, he's, and you have to believe his word. So I would get up in the mornings. I'd be the first one out of the bed, and I'd run in there with my little devotions, and I started having this hope in my heart, and I, I thought, wow, man, this is, I think, I think I might be able to do this. And I'd get on the porch, and I'd read my devotion. I'd read my word, and, and I'd just look up in the sky. I'm like, do you really see me? Do you love me? And, and so forth, and blah, blah, blah. I'd show my before picture, um, that real pretty one. That's the way I looked. <clears throat> anyway, new creation, huh? <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we, we go to the beach twice a year for a spiritual retreat. And I had just got saved. All I only had was my um, relationship going, starting. And um, when we got to the beach, I just remember walking over to the water. And like I said, I'm brand new at this. And I looked out there at the ocean. I thought, wow. Look at that massive body of water. Look at look how the waves, how does the waves not, how do they know not to come any further than that? That is crazy. And the whole beauty and wondrous, just magnificent body of water I'm looking just blew my mind because my eyes had been opened. And so that week, as I would come to the beach, I'd make my little nest and I'd walk up and down the beach, and I had my headset on, and woo, this got to be what heaven feels like. And I'd sit down, and as I'd start reading my word, I heard this little voice, and it said, get on your knees. I'm like, where was that voice coming from? That's weird. I know I'm not on crack anymore. Hold on. Oh, my God, I think I'm in a cult. I think I'm hearing things. And so I'd get my Bible and I'd do, go on about, you know, what I was doing and then we'd have group. And the second day, I think she had us outside on the beach, you know, and of course everybody's hands was raised, hey, amazing grace, and people were walking by looking at us. So I made my, my blanket on the ground and uh, as I began to read, I heard, get on your knees. And I'm like, where is that voice coming from? I know I'm not crazy, somebody's playing a joke on me. So I did that, and so Wednesday it did the same thing, and then on Thursday, it, now knowing what I know, it was the Lord calling to me. And I got up earlier than normal, and I had to get to the beach. It was just an urgency about it. And so as I got over there, and there was some kind of film in the air, I know now that it's red tide. It was red tide, and there was a bunch of seaweed in the water, and it's real frothy, and it just wasn't a beautiful day that day. And so I sat down and I began to uh, get everything, you know, to read and stuff. And I heard that voice and it said, get on your knees. And I'm like, where is that voice coming from? This has got to be crazy. I'm not getting on my knees. People will think I'm crazy. I'm a fruit loop, out, fruit loop out here. They already think we are anyway. So I grabbed my Bible and I throw it open and my eyes fell. And it was in the book of Daniel. And the scripture it fell to was, and Daniel got on his knees three times a day facing the east, worshiping his God. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I slammed my Bible shut, picked up my headphones, threw them on, hit play. And the first song that came on was, when I'm on my knees, when I'm on my knees. Nicole Mullen. And after that, I just remember throwing my headset down. I stood up, and I stumped about three or four steps down into the sand, and I fell. 
And you know, I say there's all 26 years fell. And I just remember raising my arm up to heaven and I said, is that you? I don't know what I'm doing. Am I going crazy? What do you want me to do? I don't know what I'm doing. And then I got up and I just kind of stomped out into the water about ankle deep. And I just remember staring as far as I could into the water. And I was like, did you hear me? Was that you? And I was waiting for a flipper to come up. <laughs> you know, some big, this huge sign. And as I stared into the feathers to the deep, and the wind's blowing really, really hard across my ears, and, and I heard a very faint whisper. And it said, look down. And I thought, what? And it said, look down. And as I began to look down, and I was standing just like this, and I was going, what? And then as I began to look down, and all the foamy water came up, seaweed around my ankles, everything went back out, five-second window of sand, and this came in between my feet. Now, I don't care what anybody says. You want to show that? the white flag, it didn't come over there. And I didn't have to chase it down over there. It came after I got on my knees. And then it came when I got in the water. Because you know, the world says the victory is in the fight. I fought my whole life, y'all. I fought a stepfather who just absolutely destroyed the identity of a little girl. I fought the hospital that was there to abort my first child. I fought trying to be a mom. I fought my husband. I fought addiction. I fought those folks on the street. I fought me, but I never could get my surrender, my victory. But when God gave me this flag, he whispered to me, your victory is in the surrender. I want you to let go. I want you to give up. I want you to quit running. I want you to simply let go. And I remember when I picked this flag up, I just raised it toward heaven, and I mean, my, I, I mean, I was just crying. I just knew exactly what he wanted me to do, y'all. That was 16 years ago. That flag's been in many circles, people surrendering thanks. I've never looked back. Within three months, I became the house mom to 20 to 25 women. God knew me so personally. He knew what it was going to take to build me, to use me, to make me feel important. You know, just having a responsibility. I turned around in October. We moved in July. Show the picture of me and my son. My 25-year-old son was standing there. He had come eight hours to come see his mom. It was the coolest thing. The stories were in my book. Ever since then, I've, like I said, I've never looked back. I've gotten a pardon from the state of Georgia. Oh, my goodness. It's just been the coolest thing. Um, I just want to help girls. I just want God to use me. I want him to use me. I stand before you, a woman of God, a lady, a cleaned, beautiful, redeemed woman of God that just wants to serve the Lord and get outside the walls of the church and go to another girl that I see out there and say, it's this way, it's this way, come this way, come this way, and be standing there as he calls her out of her grave and say, I'm your grave taker offer. I'm your grave clothes, I take off your grave clothes. That's what he uses us for. We're supposed to take off their grave clothes, amen? So I, wanna, I, was, I wasn't gonna do this, so before we do Tiffany, um, are we on time? What time do you get through here? When I'm done, I want to just kind of show you something. This promise showed Lisa's journey, not the other one. This is just what he took and then 
The girls, he's allowed me to help the season. I'm a Meemaw now. Let me tell you, they call me Meemaw. God told me in a jail cell, what you did not do with him, you shall do with his. They're little baseballers. And so they, they anyway, it's the coolest thing. You got it? It says Lisa, Lisa's, yep. There's not a day I regret being saved. I'm so thankful he saved me. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then, that's in Israel. Seeing my son for the first time. I found my brother after 26 years. Stories in the book. He's now in ministry. He was an alcoholic in North Dakota. That's my family. My first grandbaby. My second grandbaby. <laughs> Just helping girls. Getting driver's license. There's the flag. At the tomb. Who would have ever thought I'd have got a passport? The first car we gave. I even get to ride a camel now. Come on. Talking on the radio. More driver's license. There's my pardon from Georgia. It's our 50th vehicle. Helping girls. You see why the devil was trying to kill me? God is so good. In the last nine years, we've been able to provide 71 vehicles for girls in transition. Before we wrap up, um, I want to just tell you a few things. I brought a bowl of, after Tiffany does her, her dance, I don't want you to see it. I've got a bowl of flags down here I always take with me. And uh, Tiffany, come up. Tiffany's going to do interpretive dance. We teach this at the Potter's House. It's Signs for the Deaf. When girls come in on heroin, fentanyl, the young generation's all about fentanyl and heroin. We've got 20-year-olds, beautiful girls coming in, fentanyl and heroin. I mean, it's the craziest thing. I'm, I buried 17 girls in 16 years. And these girls are be they're just gorgeous, beautiful, awesome women. So as they come in and they're broken and they're shattered and babies are misplaced and families are over here, as we love them, as God loves them back to life, and we just love on them, like Pastor was talking about in the community, just loving them and loving them, they learn a, a way we worship is through, they learn signs for the deaf. And then we put that with music. So Tiffany's going to do this. She's learned it about four, four weeks ago. 
So Tiffany's been there. We, when girls come in also, we have a dentist that volunteers for their dental work. And then we have Miss Barbara. She does their makeovers. So as they're coming through in the Lord, um, we want them to see the outside new. So um, Tiffany was one. She just had a lot of teeth pulled. And so she's looking to get her new teeth as um, soon as she gets back. But anyway, we, you know, God just, is just amazing. I would have never saw my life what he's done with it. And when she gets through, when you see the message behind this song, if you want to come up, if there's something you need to surrender, if there's anyone, okay, anyone that um, you know that you need to pray for, get you a flag. Because I'm going to tell you what did it for me, prayer. I know my, I know my mama prayed. And I know my little boy that laid in that bed many years when his mama was gone. I'm sure he prayed. Prayer changes the heart of God. So there's some flags up here. There's a book in the back I have. If you want one, just get one. Doesn't matter to me. If you want to donate ten dollars for one, that's fine too. It goes to the ministry. But only thirty pages is my mess. The rest is God's glory in his story. So this is Tiffany. So many people calling, how could he ever know that just the brush of him would stop the flow? If he knew, would he rebuke me or shame me to the crowd? Well, I'm desperate because it's never or it's now. If I could just touch the hymn.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. How many of y'all enjoyed that? Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, uh, you come up here with me. Hallelujah. I didn't plan on crying. <laughs> you know, when you see that young lady dancing, We don't know what's behind that dance. We don't know. But we see her up here. She's looks clean. She's, you know, uh, dressed up. But we don't know her story. And we don't know what's causing her to dance. But I know the same God that's causing her to dance. It's the same God that wants to dance with you. And you know, I mean, I'm a pastor now, but I'm a Christian first. I'll always be a Christian. That's my first assignment. This is a gift God's placed on me and my wife, and we're, we're glad to be here. But as she was ministering, the only thing that really stood out to me was your beach. And this flag. And for many of us in this room, we try to fight our way through being a Christian. Yeah. Fight our way through getting across that line when God never told us to do anything. Amen. <laughs> he told us to surrender, y'all. Give our life to Him. Take upon His yoke. Take upon his burden, for it's light and it's easy. And one of the things that stood out to me was the beach. But it was the moment when she gave up and knew she could not do it on her own. That I felt like God was telling me to never, ever leave that. Never, never. Because I remember in 2017 when my wife was diagnosed with five, stage 5 kidney disease. And I thought I was a man of faith. I thought, man, I can, yeah, man, I'm a tough guy, man, I can do this. But it wasn't until I got home after a week in, in, in the hospital and all the diagnosis and, and trying to, you know, walk by faith, bless God, man, week after week, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. But finally I just said, you know, God, I surrender. I know you didn't do this to her, and I know you're not the problem, you're the answer, but I need you to help me. Yeah. And man, when you get to that place... There is no greater joy than to let it go. And from that point until now, obviously my wife is much better. And man, God's done great things. But I've told God many times, God, I don't want to ever lose what I was going through as far as my quest to get closer to you in that moment. That's the first love. That's the first love, man. When you, when, you, when you give it all to God and God reaches down and he helps you through some of the toughest things that you'll ever face. What God was telling the, the church at Ephesus in, in, in Revelations chapters you know, 2 and 3, he told that church at Ephesus, he said, look, you're doing a lot of great things, but you, you've done something. You've lost your first love. You're beginning to get cold when it once you was hot. And I believe in the American church, if there's anything that we're, what we could be guilty of, is, is we just get a little too comfortable. We get a little bit too relaxed, and we don't keep seeking God with all of our heart. Man, we should never lose that. Like she said, cars, money, all that's supposed to be used for His glory anyway. We're supposed to use that. I mean, yeah, we want it, we need it to help others, Amen. And what an honor. I bet every time y'all give away a car, y'all don't just go, man, gosh, I can't believe we're doing this. This is terrible. Amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Because you're giving away something that God gave you. So this, I, I like it. You know, even if you don't think you need a, a white flag, I, I would think that it would be good. I mean, I'm taking it home, and I'm just going to let it be something that I see all the time. and say, Lord, I'm surrendering. I'm going to surrender to you every day of my life. I'm not going to get cold. I'm not going to get complacent. 
I'm not going to take church for granted. I'm not going to take the Bible for granted. I'm not going to take fellowship with you for granted. No, God, I want you and need you more today than I've ever need you. But there could be some in this room right now that you could be struggling. You could be where these ladies are. You could be confused right now. You could be hurting. You may have voices just pounding your head and you don't know which direction to go. Maybe you're, you're, you're walking the hypocritical life and you're, you're playing the role of a Christian, but you're really not a Christian. You're really not going after God. God sees everything and God don't want you to be like that. He don't want you to hurt. He don't want you to be lost. He wants you to surrender. So before we leave today, I want to give everybody an opportunity to get that right with the Lord. I want to give God space and time for those that want it. Again, nobody's under pressure. You can get up and you can leave. Nobody's making you stay. This is only for those. They may find their life like these young ladies right here. That you're tired of doing it on your own. And we have an altar here that you can come as we play some really good music. And you can come and you can do like she said. Get on your knees. Because again, there's nothing I can give you. That's going to satisfy your soul and change your heart. But Jesus Christ has everything for you. But it's not until the moment that we're willing to come to the cross and actually surrender our lives and bow down before him. And it takes humility to do that. And the reason why I say come, because we've got to leave our junk there and we've got to walk to something new here. It's just an outward expression of an inward reality. You're walking away from something and you're walking to something. You're walking away from your past. You're walking away from your problems and you're walking to something new that Jesus has for you. Because everybody in this room has a past. Everybody in this room is screwed up, messed up. And if we was to flash everybody's past up here on this screen, we all would be embarrassed. But that's not what God wants to do. He wants to erase your past and give you a new future. A new future. That means he ain't going to remember it no more. And he don't want you to remember it no more. So everybody bow your head and close your eyes. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And I just thank you for this moment. As Miss Lisa has come and shared her story, Father God. The story of her redemption. The story of hope in her own life, Father God. I thank you, Lord, that there is stories represented in this room. And there's hearts that you have been tugging on for years. There's things in the hearts of people in this room right now that they need to walk away from. And they need to throw up the white flag and say, I surrender. So I'm asking you, Father God, as we are here in your presence, Holy Spirit, draw the hearts of the men and women that need to come to the altar to meet you. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that if you're there and you need to meet with Jesus, don't let nothing hold you back because Jesus is real and he is really in love with you. And I promise you, the Bible says if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. I pray that boldness would come upon you right now and you would walk away from a messed up life and come to a brand new life in Jesus if that's you and the Lord's tugging on you, don't be shy, don't be bashful. Hallelujah, Jesus, we love you. Glory to God, Father, we love you today. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. We love you, we love you, we love you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Do you have anything else? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus, we come before you today. And I pray for every single person that's coming, Father God, and bowing down before you. The Father, in the name of Jesus. You're meeting them right there, right now. That what they need, Father God, you're giving it to them right now. I pray, Father God, for all of the past 
all of the condemnation, all of the guilt, all of the shame. I thank you, Lord, they bring it today and lay it at the foot of the cross. Never to pick it up again, Father. Never, never, never. They are new creations in Christ Jesus, Father. They're laying their junk at your feet right now, Father God. They're laying this, this, these bad decisions, Father God. Laying these sins at the foot of the cross. And I pray right now, Father God, that the, the love of God, the forgiveness of God is gripping their heart. That your arms are going around them right now, Father God, and letting them know everything's going to be okay. I got you. I got you. I pray that the God of Lisa, Father God, the God of Nathan, hallelujah, the God of, uh, 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 of Isaac, Abraham, Jacob, Father God, is touching them right now in Jesus' name. Your will be done, Father, in their life. Hallelujah. And I would pray if you're not up here that you would stretch your hands and your hearts and your faith with them. They need you. They don't need observers. They need warriors that will get with them. Hallelujah. Father, we, we stand with these, these wonderful children of yours. We stand with them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. I lay my hands.